welcome back. Uh, 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 in the last lecture we discussed various kinds of informal fallacies, informal fallacies which arises out of the fallacy of relevance. If the premises are not relevant to the conclusion then these kinds of fallacies arises and informal fallacies can only be detected by analyzing the content of the argument. So whereas the formal fallacies which we have uh, we studied earlier so these those fallacies which uh, can be detected only by the form of the argumentation. So formal fallacies usually arises in the case of deductive arguments whereas informal fallacies might arise in the case of uh, other kinds of arguments that we uh, use in day to day discourse mostly inductive kind of arguments. So uh, in the last class we we studied different kinds of informal fallacies which come under the category of fallacies of relevance and you should note that uh, this is not a final kind of classification this classification is only we are using it for our convenience to classify these uh, these fallacies into some kind of group you know we are grouping it into some kind of uh, thing you know. So under informal fallacies we are studying fallacies of relevance under which we study different kinds of fallacies such as fallacies by appealing to force, fallacies by invoking pity in the mind of a reader or listener or fallacies uh, such as ad hominem kind of fallacy, fallacy of accident and missing the point kind of fallacy etc. You know. So today we will be studying two more fallacies uh, which are under the category of uh, uh, fallacies of relevance they are red herring and straw man arguments. So these two are extremely important kind of fallacies usually we, we find these kinds of fallacies in day to day argumentation etc. So in all the fallacies that we have discussed we have an arguer and we have a reader or listener or sometimes it may be an opponent or sometimes there is a different arguer and all. So uh, an arguer presents some kind of uh, today we will be discussing two important kind of fallacies they are red herring and strawman fallacy. So what is a red herring kind of fallacy? So in the red herring kind of fallacy here is an arguer A, so, so here is your reader or listener R stands for reader, reader in a sense that you will be reading somebody's arguments and all or listener and you will be listening to somebody's arguments and all. So A the arguer draws off track the reader or listener and he poses some kind of uh, conclusion. So this is what he wants to persuade the reader or listener to accept. So what he does here is he draws off track the reader or listener and he poses some kind of conclusion. In all. So what he does here is he changes the subject matter of the argument maybe that subject matter might be of uh, interest to the reader or listener. So he will show a lot of interest to that uh, subject matter. So A knows that reader or listener is interested in such kind of subject matter. So A easily draws off track the reader or listener and poses some kind of conclusion and all. So he starts with some particular kind of thing but he changes the subject matter and his conclusions will be based on whatever he has changed it and all whatever the subject matter which he has changed it in the due course. So the one of the important things you should note is note here is this that the reader or listener may not be in a position to point out uh, uh, that you know A is drawing off track the argument and all. So reader or listener may not be in a position to notice it and all. So we A cleverly draws off track the reader or listener and then he will pose some kind of conclusion in that case it is called as uh, red herring kind of argument. So in the red herring kind of arguments the structure of the arguments will be like this your premises will be something like uh, something relevant to the topic at hand is described then he changes the subject matter of that uh, particular kind of thing and then in the conclusion what happens is a distracting but often unnoticed change of subject occurs that is, a, that is the thing which he achieves in the premises and then a different kind of conclusion follows. Now. Let us consider one simple example uh, to see where the arguer is trying to off track the reader or listener. So here is an example uh, there is a good deal of talk these days about the need to eliminate pesticides from our fruits 
from our fruit and vegetables. So he is uh, is talking something relevant to the topic. Uh, the topic at hand is the pesticides and all. So now uh, he draws off track the reader or listener in this way. Now he goes on and talks about this particular kind of thing. But many of these foods are essential to our health. Carrots are an excellent source of vitamin A. Broccoli is rich in iron. Oranges and grapes, etc., fruits which are which are having high vitamin C. You know, he started with uh, the subject matter pesticides, that is eliminating pesticides and all. Then he changed the subject matter to the importance of vitamins in the diet, etc. You know. So this, uh, although it seems to be the case that he is uh, talking about the fruits, but he is talking about something else. You know. So he changed the subject matter from pesticides to uh, there is a subtle change in the subject matter and all. So then, uh, so he has to. Uh, the conclusion here is is that uh, we, uh, somehow he wants to establish that we need to eliminate the pesticides from our fruits and vegetables and all. But he is saying that you know. Uh, that should not be the case in all. So by invoking some kind of importance of uh, these fruits, dietary uh, uh, consequences etc and all, uh, what kind of vitamins are present in that particular kind of uh, fruit etc, he is focusing on some other topic and then he poses some kind of conclusion in all. Actually what uh, the arguer is trying to show here is this that uh, we need not have to eliminate pesticides from uh, fruits and vegetables and all. So why uh, in what way what sense he is arguing he is arguing that all these things consist of uh, uh, vitamins etc and all so that is why uh, we should not eliminate pesticides from uh, our fruits and vegetables and all. So the subject matter has been changed from uh, pesticides to the importance of vitamins in the fruits etc and all. So with that he poses some kind of conclusions whatever he wants to convince the reader or listener and all. In that case the arguer A is said to have committed the fallacy which is called as red herring fallacy. This red herring fallacy as uh, I mean uh, got his name in a sense that uh, uh, usually some kind of hunting dogs uh, they are they usually trained uh, uh, to follow some kind of scent. So whenever uh, I mean uh, they it if they if it is a good hunting dog and all it will be able to able to chase the uh, Sent and then, uh, so it will not be off track and all. So it will be able to chase the scent in particular, uh, incense, etc. So this red herring has come from that particular kind of idea and all. So here, the reader in general off tracks the reader or listener and poses some kind of conclusion and all, and hence he seems to be committing this particular kind of fallacy. Another kind of fallacy which you commonly see is this that it is called as a straw man argument. In the straw man argument you have an arguer and you have an opponent and then what the arguer does is the arguer attacks the misrepresentation of the opponent's view and all. So the idea here is to describe something that sounds like you know opponent's view but, but it is easier to knock down and then to refute and all. So usually these uh, straw man arguments will have this particular kind of structure premise will be like this that a misrepresentation of the view is usually false he shows that it is false and all and the conclusion is that actually that view is false and all. So in this case uh, what happens is uh, uh, this thing instead of a drawing off track the reader or uh, reader or listener instead of reader or listener you have an opponent and all. The opponent may be your enemy or maybe something else whom you do not like and all. So what he does here is instead of changing the subject matter subtly and all minimally etc and all here what he does is he distorts the original argument and all. So he knows that uh, his opponent's arguments cannot be uh, suppose if he takes opponent's argument actual argument into consideration there is no way in which he can. Uh, he can conclude uh, he can come up with some kind of misrepresentation and then he cannot show that the opponent's arguments are false and all or unsound. So what he does is he distorts the opponent's argument and then he poses some kind of conclusion.
in that process A is said to be committing this straw man kind of fallacy. So how this name has come into existence so this is what is the actual man let us say actual person or something like that and then this is what is uh, straw man etc which he is trying to construct. So actual man uh, person will be having some actual arguments which the arguer knows that it is very difficult to attack and all. So this is the actual argument presented by his opponent and all but uh, what he does is uh, corresponding to the actual man he constructs a straw man. and then this straw man or straw person uh, is corresponding to some kind of straw kind of argument these are not actual arguments and all. So now what he does here is he knocks down the straw man he destroys the uh, straw man in a sense that he is destroying straw man's argument and all. So that means he is attacking the uh, arguments of a straw man rather than the actual person actual person he knows that he cannot attack those arguments and all. So what he does is he distorts the argument by constructing some kind of straw person and attaches some kind of straw arguments to him and then he knocks down this uh, straw person and he thinks that actually he has attacked the actual argument and all but what he has done uh, arguer has done is he distorted the argument and then he has given some kind of misrepresentation of what the actual uh, misrepresentation of an actual argument or the actual arguer might be arguing something else here in this case opponent and all. So he knocks down the straw and thinks that he's, he has knocked down the argument of a an actual person but actually that is not the case so he he knocked down the straw man and the, he knocked down only the misrepresentation of what what we see in the actual argument of an opponent and all. So if that happens then this is called as some kind of straw man kind of argument and all. actually he is knocking down the straw man rather than the actual person corresponding to actual person is corresponding to the actual argument straw man is having straw man argument now straw argument you can say. So the structure of this argument has this particular kind of thing a misrepresentation of the view he shows that you know already distorted the argument and all and then he has come up with some kind of misrepresentation of an argument so he could come up with some kind of misrepresentation of opponents argument then he can clearly show that that is false and all but actually the arguer is not the arguer in question is not presenting this particular kind of argument you know it is the opponent who has uh, misrepresented uh, the view of an actual uh, argument or actual arguer whatever actual arguer is trying to say. So since he distorted the argument and then he showed that uh, it is a misrepresentation uh, it is it is constituting to be a misrepresentation obviously you can show that if you distort the argument and uh, and uh, you misrepresent it and then that view may be turned out to be false you know. So straw man consists of making uh, your own position appear strong by making the oppos opposing po opponent's position appear weaker than actually it is. So an opponent has presented some kind of argument you know. So that may be very strong enough and all uh, in which the arguer is not able to attack you know. So what he does now he misrepresents the, uh, uh, his original argument and all and then he distorts the argument and all and he comes up with uh, a different kind of argument which is called as misrepresentation of an actual argument. So the intention of an arguer is this that he wants to make the opponent's position weaker and all he can only do it by distorting the argument you have to note here that uh, the arguer is not trying to change the subject matter of an argument like in the case of red herring he is not drawing off track the arguer or leader or listener and all where he changed the subject matter very subtly and all which you know the reader or leader may not uh, reader or listener may not be able to uh, identify that particular kind of change and all change in the subject matter but here arguer clearly distorts the argument of an opponent and all. So if that happens whatever I explained here if the arguer distorts the argument of an opponent 
and puts his position in such a way that his arguments are very weak then obviously he can attack an opponent's argument and all if that is the case then A is said to have committed this particular kind of fallacy which is called as straw man fallacy. So some examples might help us in understanding this concept in a better way so an arguer is arguing in this way Mr. Goldberg whatever is considered in this argument is usually considered as an opponent of an arguer. So he is arguing the arguer is arguing like this Mr. Goldberg has argued against prayer in the public schools so that is what is the actual thing which Goldberg is trying to say maybe he has argued for against the public schools to maintain some secularism all kinds of things and all. maybe it might be a very strong argument etc and all. it is very difficult to find flaws with that particular kind of argument. So now the arguer is saying here now Goldberg is opponent for this arguer and all. So now the arguer is goes on, goes on and says that Mr. Goldberg ad advocates atheism atheism is uh, atheism is a position in which he do not believe the existence of God but atheism is what they used to have in Russia in the past atheism leads to the suppression of all religions and the replacement of God by an omnipotent state. So he is distorting the actual argument actual argument is uh, the argument against the prayer in the public schools for some reasons he might not have provided these kinds of reasons and all one can be an atheist but still he can argue for against uh, atheist and still he can argue against the prayer and all since he if he has some secular values etc and all he can still argue for uh, argument against the prayer and all in the public schools. So he goes on and says that is it what we want for this country etc and all I hardly think so so clearly Mr. Goldberg's argument is nonsense so ultimately he, is, uh, he wants to show that Goldberg's argument is nonsense but if he takes Goldberg's actual arguments into consideration he may not be able to do that particular kind of thing now he is distorted the argument and then he is bringing in all the irrelevant uh, uh, factors such as uh, atheism uh, he is an atheist and uh, what happened in Russia all these things uh, and then atheism leads to suppression of all religions etc and all this need not, need not be the case a replacement of God by some kind of omnipotent state as Marx was pointing out all these things may not be relevant to what actually Goldberg is trying to argue. So here what happened was is that Goldberg who is considered to be an opponent of an arguer he has put his position in such a way that his arguments look very weak you know. So he distorted the argument and then he, he destroyed the distorted argument and all. So ultimately his intention is to show that Goldberg's argument is nonsense if he takes the actual argument he cannot say that particular kind of thing so he changes he distorts the argument according to his convenience and then he shows that whatever follows from the distorted argument he will show that that is obviously false you know he constructs in a very nice way in a in a clever way you know in which you know obviously it will look a look like a weak argument you know so that is what it does distorts the argument and then he poses a conclusion based on the distorted argument and all. So in that case uh, the arguer is uh, seems to have persuaded the reader or listener and then he poses this particular kind of conclusion then the opponent uh, should be in a position to say that your, uh, the arguer has distorted the argument and all. So one should be clever enough to identify whether the arguer the arguer's intention and all is he trying to destroy distort the argument or uh, is trying to change the subject matter as in the case of red herring uh, fallacy. So there are other examples which we take into consideration suppose if an arguer is arguing in this way for example we desperately somebody argues like this we desperately need a nationalized health care program that looks well and good and all so those who oppose it think that there are many people who seems to be opposing at that moment for example so now he is attacking the opponents uh, whosoever is opposing this particular kind of nationalized health care program so now those who oppose it think that private sector will take care of the need of the poor but this has not been the case in the past and will not be obviously will not be in the future etc and all that may not be directly relevant to the need for a nationalized health care program 
again he seems to be distorting the argument and then he is talking about something else and all. So, if we if an arguer distorts the argument uh, of an opponent uh, then uh, the arguer is said to have committed this particular kind of fallacy which is called as fallacies uh, fallacies of relevance and that is called as Strawman kind of fallacy. So, in simple terms so what what actually is doing is actual person is corresponding to some kind of actual arguments straw person construct another straw man which is an imaginary kind of thing which is which he thinks that it easily he can knock down the straw, straw person and all and then he, he attributes some kind of uh, argument to the straw person and then he knocks down the straw and then he thinks that he has actually destroyed the original argument and all. original argument stands as it is but what he has knocked down is the straw person and corresponding the distorted kind of argument and all from that uh, some kind of uh, conclusion follows from that. So, this is what is uh, considered to be a straw man kind of argument sometimes uh, these arguments may also be very persuasive and sometimes there may not be any fallacy involved in uh, these particular kind of uh, examples. Suppose if one argues that empiricism is the view that nothing should be believed in unless until it can be directly observed. So, now one can see here taste smell touch touch protons electrons quarks etc and all you can see the effects of these things. So, while empiricists pretend to be advocates of science their views in fact rule out most of the advanced physical science of our times most of the advanced physical science of our times involves the presence of electrons protons etc and all which we you can only see the effects of these things, but you cannot directly see the things and all. So, that seems to be a good and well crafted kind of argument for this particular kind of view. So, so now what is the difference between the straw man and red herring kind of fallacy? Both are fallacies of relevance. So, the premises are irrelevant to the conclusion because in the one case, in the case of red herring the arguer changes the subject matter whereas in the case of straw man the arguer distorts the argument you know. there is a difference between change of subject matter and totally distorting the argument. You know. So, in the case of straw man the first thing which we need to note is, is that arguer distorts the opponents argument. So, how he does it he constructs a straw man and he knocks down the straw man straw person and say that actually he knocked down the original argument which is attached to the original uh, arguer's argument. In the case of red herring the arguer either changes the topic or subject matter. So, he knows that the reader or listener is interested or passionate about some kind of sub subject matter and all he knows when to change the subject matter of an argument. And all. So, he slightly changes the subject matter and then he poses conclusion based on the changed kind of subject matter and all. So, in that case it is called as red herring. So, in the case of straw man opponents position is mischaracterized or misrepresented in such a way that it is easier to represent and dismiss. You know. If he has represented if he has correctly represented him it is very difficult to argue uh, against his uh, position and also he knows that he has to misrepresent his position in some way or other. So, he constructs a straw man and uh, correspond to that a straw argument and all which is which he imagines to be the actual argument, but actually that is not the case. So, in the case of red herring a distraction is introduced into the discourse in order to lead an opponent or audience away from the issue at hand. So, he clearly knows when to introduce this distraction and all in that case in you know, arguer may not be in a position to notice the change in the subject matter and all. So, he cleverly does it when to change it when when to change the subject matter etc and all the arguer is smart enough to know that particular kind of thing. So, a distraction is introduced into the discourse in order to lead an opponent or an audience away from the issue at hand. So, that is what happens in the case of red herring the third one in the straw man an arguer attributes a position to someone that actually did not uh, take into consideration he is not having that particular kind of view he is not responsible for that particular kind of argument and all. But you know he misrepresents him and then he attributes some kind of position which is actually not accepted by that actual arguers uh, actual arguers arguments you know, which you will not find it in the 
actual arguer's argument. So in the case of red herring uh, usually what happens is ignoring the actual subject matter and all. So he draws off track from the original topic and then he moves to some other topic which is closely relevant to the initial topic and all. So ignore, ignorance is what is considered to be uh, important here. So in the case of Strawman fourth point is, is that it always involves two arguers. So that is uh, uh, for distorting an argument you need to have an, your opponent and all an arguer an opponent and then you will be distorting uh, uh, your opponent's position and all. So that means at least two arguers are important in the case of Strawman. But in the case of uh, red herring one arguer who is arguing a particular kind of thing is sufficient and all he is drawing off track reader or listener who may not be involved in the particular kind of argument and all. So it may not be directly involved in that particular kind of thing. So one arguer is enough for this particular kind of uh, fallacy in the case of red herring. So another for example you find it in the textbooks for example you are the reader or listener so you are not directly engaged in the argument and all. but in the case of strawman two people are actually involved in the argument one is usually the arguer who wants to misrepresent his opponent's position another one is opponent and all he is also another kind of arguer. Just in the case of ad hominem arguments also two arguers are important now because ad hominem arguments are always directed towards another arguer and all. So it is in response to what others argue and then A1 will be responding to A2's argument and all. Okay, this is the one of the important differences between strawman and red herring although it looks like that change of subject matter is same as distorting the argument but actually that is not the case. So the fifth one is this that in the straw man it tries to justify the rejection of a position by an attack on different and usually a weaker kind of position and all. So actual person has an actual argument which is strong argument and all for example then he changes or misrepresented it in such a way that that will look very weak kind of argument and all. he changes it distorts the argument and all he looks like you know premises may be weak enough to support the conclusion and all. Then he totally distorted the argument and all, and then he shows that the conclusion is false and all. Conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. So fallacies, uh, one of the important definitions of fallacies is, is that one doesn't follow from something. Non sequita. That is the one, the phrase that we have used earlier. So in the case of red herring fallacy, what happens is, is that it tries to justify the conclusion irrelevant to the issue at hand because you know it's changed the subject matter of the sentence uh, subject matter of the argument and all so that is totally different and all from that he poses some kind of conclusion actually he could have done it from the actual subject matter and all then it would not have created problem here he cleverly changed the subject matter and draws off track the reader or listener and then he is posing some kind of conclusion and all so that led to this red herring kind of fallacy these are some of the important differences between strawman and red herring and then so usually in the case of a red herring argument arguer ignores opponent's argument if there is any such kind of conclusion which is present in his argument and subtly subtly change the subject matter it will not change the subject matter completely and all but it changes very subtly and all. In the case of strawman uh, it distorts an opponent's argument and concludes by knocking down the distorted argument. So he presents some kind of distorted argument he knocks down the distorted argument it is just like knocking down the straw rather than the actual man. So this is what happens in the case of straw man argument. So there are some examples which we can take into consideration a little bit later but so these examples we will consider it a little bit later for example so far we have studied about various kinds of fallacies let us consider at least some three examples and all and we will see what kind of fallacy it is. It is somewhat some fallacy of relevance or fallacy maybe a formal fallacy etc and all. Let us consider the first example. All the really hot new thinkers are using principles from sociobiology so now it is a new wave in ethics so we should accept the principles of sociobiology. So this fallacy seems to be uh, like you know fallacy by appealing to people it is also called as bandwagon kind of argument 
99 people does something and then you do not want to be singled out from that particular kind of thing and you also start believing that particular kind of thing. Since it is a popular new wave in ethics that does not mean that you should accept the principles of sociobiology and all even if 99 people accept it, but still you can critically examine it and then you can consider some of the weak points of it and then you yet you can you need not have to accept the principles of sociobiology and all. So, this is appeal to people kind of fallacy. So, it is like you know 99 people jump in plunge into the well that does not mean that you should also jump into the well and all. Now, consider the second argument Professor Kapoor this uh, this paper merits at least B this is what the student is arguing with uh, a professor I stayed up all night working on it and if I do not get B then I will put on academic probation and my grades will suffer and so on and so forth will happen my entire family is dependent on me I am poor I am coming from the poor family all these things you know he tries to say. So, ultimately the conclusion is this that this paper merits at least that means I should get at least B. So, uh, getting B is dependent on so many other factors and all it is not uh, what the arguer is trying to do here is he invokes evokes pity in the mind of Professor Kapoor and then he is posing this particular kind of conclusion the conclusion is this that you should get B. You know. So, this is clearly an argument from pity third one smoking cigarettes can harm one's health. So, it is best to avoid smoking assuming one wants to be healthy. So, it, it seems that uh, there does not seem to be any particular kind of fallacy because smoking causes uh, uh, harm to one's health and all. So, there seems to be no fallacy in this particular kind of argument there is no mistake in this argument. So, these examples we will consider a little bit later now we will move on to inductive arguments inductive arguments can also be fallacious. So, what are the inductive arguments when inductive arguments are fallacious and it is called as fallacies of weak induction. So, far we have studied fallacies of uh, relevance uh, where the premises are irrelevant to the conclusion in most of the cases in this case what happens here is, is premises are uh, not sufficient enough to provide evidence to believe the conclusion to be true enough they are usually considered as weak arguments weak arguments are automatically considered to be fallacious kind of arguments. So, uh, all the inductive arguments can be fallacious you know. So, inductive arguments are defined as arguments that are intended to be usually strong or weak you know, but inductive argument cannot can never be valid or invalid if you use this concepts validity and invalidity or if you attribute validity and invalidity to inductive arguments is a mistake which will be uh, is a mistake you know. we can only talk about strength of the inductive argument. So, these are some of the examples which we have already discussed in greater detail a directive argument is like this all crows are black. So, if there is a crow on the top of the charminar then it has to be black and all all crows are black it is a kind of generalization without any exception if you believe that particular kind of thing to be true then if you find some other uh, kind of uh, crow on the top of the chamina then it has to be black only it cannot be white and all provided uh, you take into consideration all crows are black is absolutely true and all there is no exception for that particular kind of thing, but actually in day to day discourse that is not the case a uh, better best thing to represent this argument is most of the crows are black and all. So, inductive argument is this that in all crows that we have observed so far are black it is based on your observations etcetera and then based on your observations you move you are moving beyond whatever you observed and you are predicting that probably all crows are black and all in color. So, the conclusion always goes beyond what is stated in the premises conclusion need not have to follow uh, necessarily from the premises and then there is always some kind of new information and these arguments are all defeasible kind of arguments that means addition of uh, new information lead to the lead to withdrawal of your conclusions that you have derived earlier. So, these are some of the inductive arguments basically you will find uh, inductive generalizations for example, if you say I have lots of friends most of them think that I would make great president of Gymkhana ITK. So, most of the ITK students will probably agree with it. So, it need not be the case that most of the ITK students would not probably agree with this particular kind of thing you know just because he has lots of friends 
doesn't mean that he'll be elected as uh, some kind of Jim Kana president and all, or everyone wants him to be some kind of uh, president of Jim Kana of IITK and all. Or suppose you know we make these kind of inductive generalizations all the time. Suppose if a mess worker in the hostel stole my bicycle and all, so I'll come to some kind of sweeping generalization. I will say that all mess workers are thieves and all. So it's a kind of some kind of sweeping generalization and all. So when uh, the generalizations are not used in a proper sense, if you use some kind of sweeping generalization, then that is considered to be a mistake in the argumentation and all. So when we talk about uh, slippery uh, inductive generalizations, then uh, we'll discuss all these things in greater detail. Inductive generalizations can be also be fallacious and all. So some questions we need to ask uh, for this particular kind of thing. That is, are the premises are acceptable? Is the sample too small? Is the sample biased, prejudiced, and all prejudices, biases are there in the argument? Are the results affected by other sources of bias? All these things we need to ask uh, to come up with some kind of good inductive generalization. Otherwise, it will lead to some kind of fallacy. So, why this? Uh, why I am talking more about this inductive generalizations? Here is a this is an argument presented by a famous philosopher. Hume, David Hume, his argument is called as Hume's skeptical argument for believing this uh, uh, justification of inductive generalization. So, under what basis an inductive generalization can be justified? You know? An inductive generalization can be like this. Uh, for example, if you say metal one starts expanding upon heating, metal two starts upon expands upon heating, and then you will generalize it and say that all metals expands upon heating and all. So this is this serves as some kind of inductive generalization and then gradually you will elevate it to some kind of law statement and all. So now under what conditions this kind of inductive generalizations can be justified and all. So Hume has presented some kind of skeptical argument he says that it cannot be justified either by means of principles of logic or by means of induction itself or by experience and all. So he says that our inductive generalization seems to rest on the assumption that unobserved cases will follow from the patterns that we discovered in so far from the observed cases and all. So from the observed cases unobserved kind of uh, things follows and all. Most of the crows that you observed so far are black in color. The next crow that you are going to see which is not there in the premises and all. So that is unobserved kind of thing. So we are predicting that the next crow that you are going to see is also going to be black and all. So from you are moving from observed to unobserved kind of cases and all. So that is our inductive generation seem to presuppose that nature operates uniformly and all. So what is the guarantee that uh, this will lead to the next one and all the next crow is also going to be black and all 99 percent of the cases tells us that that is going to be black and all usually we predict our gut feeling says that the next bird that you are going to see is also going to be black in color. So how do we know that uh, that is going to be the case and all in, uh, in the next case also that is going to be true then we are relying on the principle of uniformity of nature universe does not behave in a in a random way and all uh, it behaves in the in a uniform way etc and all. So because of that obviously the next bird that you are going to see is also turned out to be black in color. So the way things are observed to behave here and uh, now are accurate indicators of how things behave anywhere and at any time, but what right can we assume that the nature is uniform. How do we know that uh, universe is, uh, is governed by this principle of uniformity of nature. So he goes on and says that because this claim itself asserts a contingent matter of fact it could only be established by inductive reasoning. So the idea here is very simple that is uh, under what basis you can say that sun rises in the east uh, tomorrow and all. So it, it, it arose in the east all the time that you every time you got up from the bed you saw that sun rises in the east. Under what basis you can justify that the unobserved case that is about tomorrow's thing under what conditions it is, uh, is, is going to arise uh, in the east only. So you are saying that uh, since uh, universe behaves in a certain way and then uh, it, it behaved in a certain order orderly way 
uh, yesterday, maybe day before yesterday, etc. And all the universe also behaves in the same way, maybe day after tomorrow also, or maybe tomorrow also. So, under what basis you can justify these particular kind of inductive generalizations and all? You are relying on principle of uniformity of nature. What is principle of uniformity of nature? Again, it is some kind of form of inductive induction and all. So that means induction is justified by induction itself like sun always rises in the east or all metals expands upon heating etc then we are relying on principle of uniformity of nature universe always behaves in a certain way and uh, we do not have any exceptions etc and all and uh, we assume that universe also behaves in the same way maybe tomorrow or maybe day after tomorrow also it behaves in the same way etc and all it, that makes uh, this, uh, uh, this uniformity of nature and all. So, Hume says that if induction inductive generations are justified by principle of uniformity of nature which itself is some kind of induction then it leads to some kind of circularity. So principle of uniformity of nature that is the claim that itself asserts some contingent matter of fact it could only be established by some kind of inductive reasoning. So that means principle of uniformity of nature worked yesterday principle of uniformity of nature worked tape for yesterday etc is going to work tomorrow and all the time it works and all that is a kind of inductive argument you know. but because all inductive reasoning presupposes that the principle of nature is uniform that means any inductive justification of this principle would always seem to be circular because if you want to just if you are asked to justify inductive generalizations like all metals expands upon heating or uh, sun always rises in the east etc and all you are falling back on principle of uniformity of nature which itself is nothing but a kind of inductive kind of argument. So induction is justified by induction so it leads to some kind of circularity. So it seems then that we all have no ultimate justification for inductive reasoning at all. So that is what is the skeptical argument of Hume even till to date there was no appropriate solution for this particular kind of uh, argument how to justify induction and all. But we heavily rely on induction in natural sciences in particular that whenever a scientist is coming up with some kind of law statement what he will be making is simply some kind of inductive generalization and inductive generalizations based on some principle of uniformity of nature etc. He always takes it for granted that principle universe behaves in a certain way in order etc. Suppose what happens if the universe does not behave. Uh, in the same in the same order that we are trying to expect and all. So then the, the principle uh, of uniformity of nature may turn out to be false and then an inductive generalization rested on uh, principle of uniformity of nature uh, can be questioned and all. So this is the skeptical argument presented by whom and then ultimately concluded that uh, inductive generalizations cannot be justified and all. If it is justified it has to be based on either deduction which cannot be the case because inductive arguments cannot be justified by, by invoking some kind of deduction and all. In the case of deduction it is obvious that conclusion necessarily follows from the premises but clearly in this case inductive generalizations it is always be the case that conclusion goes beyond what is stated in the premises. So induction cannot be justified by deduction that is ruled out but whether in un, under what condition induction can be justified and all. So then you are saying that principle of uniformity of nature that is making you to believe that sun always rises in the east is going to be true today tomorrow or maybe day after tomorrow also or maybe all the time that you observe uh, sun uh, after getting up from your bed. So induction what is the principle of uniformity of nature that is again induction only induction cannot be justified by induction. So in either cases there is seems to be a problem so that is why Hume poses some kind of skeptical kind of conclusion means uh, that means doubtful kind of conclusion that you know induction cannot be uh, inductive generalizations cannot be justified you know. So we will look into this aspect uh, maybe in greater detail later but uh, so this is a reference in which you know uh, you will find this particular kind of argument David Hume a treatise of human nature second edition Oxford University Press in 146 page you might find a skeptical kind of argument. So forget about uh, this uh, negative aspect of uh, inductive kind of arguments and all but inductive arguments are useful for us and their uh, inductive generalizations are important 
in coming up with some kind of law statements etc and all scientists require this inductive generalizations and all. So then you know once you propose law statements they can elevate it to some kind of formal theory and etc and all. So, so I have said in the beginning that even inductive arguments can also be fallacious and all when all the weak inductive arguments are obviously fallacious arguments in a sense that premises will not be sufficient enough or they are not providing adequate support to believe the conclusion to be true and all. So all the inductive arguments which we spoke about in the basic concepts they lead to this particular kind of fallacies and all. So these are some of the important fallacies of weak induction number one appeal to unqualified authority the Latin name of that one is uh, argumentum ad vericundium and second one appeal to ignorance because you know all these arguments come under the category of inductive arguments if the premises are not uh, providing sufficient evidence to believe the conclusion to be true then it leads to the weak argument you know. all weak arguments are fallacious arguments and then hasty generalization uh, false cause slippery slope weak analogy all this comes under these are all weak these are inductive arguments if they are weak enough then they are called as fallacies of weak induction fallacies of weak induction arises especially when your premises are not able to provide sufficient evidence to believe your conclusion to be true in that case then it leads to fallacies of weak induction let us consider one example uh, one the first one that is fallacy of weak induction arises because of appealing to unqualified authority. So uh, this arises in this uh, particular way uh, the diagram for this one uh, is uh, like this. Uh, so what happens here is this that arguer cites some kind of unqualified authority and then he poses some kind of conclusion. So this is what happens uh, here. Uh, so you have an arguer A so what he does is he cites some kind of authority unqualified authority so AU means unqualified qualified authority and then he poses a conclusion so that means his conclusion is based on uh, falling back on some kind of unqualified authority if it is based on qualified authority and all then there does not seem to be mistake in the argumentation. So it is not considered as a fallacy of weak induction because strong argument so definitely it is not a um, uh, fallacy of weak induction. So now the question that comes to us is what constitutes a qualified authority and what constitutes an unqualified authority and all. Uh, there are some fields uh, in which it is very difficult to say that a person has any authority and all one is religion politics ethics etc all these uh, values etc and all somebody who is studying about values it is very difficult to become an expertise in this particular kind of area and all. So somebody is arguing something uh, related to political kind of thing and all it is very difficult to have authority on these particular kind of subjects. So we can question the authority of uh, a person especially when he is talking when he is making some claims about uh, values judgments etc and all. So uh, what is uh, considered as uh, appeal to unqualified authority this argument looks like this it is an argument in which the conclusion is based on the judgment of someone who is not actually the an authority uh, on the issue at hand. So he refers to unqualified authority and he poses some kind of conclusion or it is an argument which is based on the judgment of a genuine authority on the issue at hand but concerns an issue about which there is no disagreement uh, among experts in the field and all then also it is called as an unqualified authority and all the problem here is is that uh, although he refers to uh, some kind of uh, genuine authority and all but the problem here is is that there is disagreement among experts in the field and all so then that is also considered to be some kind of unqualified authority 
So, these are some of the examples which we take into consideration, but we did not answer what constitutes a qualified authority, what constitutes an unqualified authority and all. For example, a person uh, who has expertise uh, expertise in uh, uh, politics etcetera, he may not be able to, uh, he may not be having expertise in medicine or what kind of drugs one should take etcetera and all. Or a person uh, may be having authority in one or more fields as well. A person who is good in mathematics will may be good in physics as well. So, he has uh, different kinds of expertise in all, maybe more than one field in all. Or in the same way, for example, a mathematician all of a sudden starts claiming that everyone should take some drug, uh, prescribe some kind of drug, uh, etcetera, and all, then you know we will usually question his expertise. So, when somebody poses some kind of a conclusion uh, based on even though he is a great mathematician and all. But still, you know, we uh, will be doubtful about his particular kind of arguments and all, because he's not having expertise in the medicine now. So let us consider a simple example, and then we'll uh, end this lecture. So Tom Jones, a respected actor, who plays the brilliant cardiologist, let us say Dr. John Smith in the film Emergency, recommends some kind of drug in improving the overall health of the heart. So therefore, it would be wise to take this particular kind of drug. You know. I might be a fan of Tom Jones or etc and all and I admire him a lot etc and all he acted brilliantly uh, as a cardiologist etc and all but does not mean that if he starts prescribing some kind of drug then you start uh, believing uh, taking his statements seriously you know. that means you should use it would be wise to take drug X then if you conclude that it would be wise to take, take drug X then uh, and the arguer is uh, citing some kind of unqualified authority, unqualified authority in the sense that he is referring to an actor who is not having any expertise in the medicine and is posing this particular kind of conclusion that it would be wise to take drug X. And all. So in this uh, uh, lecture what we have seen is uh, we have discussed uh, fallacies of informal fallacies especially fallacies of in, uh, informal fallacies in the sense that uh, fallacies of relevance under which we discussed uh, straw man and red herring arguments we discuss uh, in detail the distinction between uh, uh, the red herring fallacy and uh, straw man's argument on the one hand we have change of subject matter is the one which you see in the case of straw man argument where the arguer draws off track the reader or listener and in the case of uh, straw man the arguer distorts the argument and misrepresents uh, the original position of an argument and he poses some conclusion he shows that the arguer's argument is weak enough you know, because misrepresentation out of misrepresentation he concludes something and which shows that the argument uh, arguer's argument are weak enough. You know. Then we moved on to uh, inductive generalizations and then we discussed about whether these inductive generalizations can be justified etc. And then we have presented Hume's skeptical argument and then we showed that inductive generalizations cannot be justified either by deduction or by induction and all. If you, uh, if you justify it based on deduction then uh, inductive arguments cannot be justified by deduction and inductive arguments are justified by induction then it leads to some kind of circularity and all. So despite having these problems with the inductive generalizations we moved on to some of the mistakes that we commonly make with respect to inductive arguments and all. So when we make mistakes with respect to inductive arguments they are called as fallacies of weak induction. So one particular kind of fallacy we discussed that is fallacy by appealing to unqualified authority. So when, a, when an arguer is citing an unqualified authority who is not having expertise in that particular area and then he poses some particular kind of conclusion and we are said to have committed this fallacy of unqualified authority. So in the next lecture we will be covering some other interesting and exciting kind of uh, fallacies which come under the category of fallacies of weak induction. So they are uh, fallacies which arises out of cause and effect or uh, it may be kind of slippery slope and uh, some other uh, very interesting kind of fallacies which we will discuss it in the next lecture. In all these fallacies one of the most important thing you should note is this that premises are not able to they are not we are an arguer. Uh, especially the premises are not enough to provide sufficient evidence to believe the conclusion to be true then these kinds of fallacies arises and all. So the arguments are weak so that is why they are called as uh, uh, weak induction and all. 
So in the next class we will continue uh, with uh, um, slippery slope and uh, some other very interesting kind of fallacies weak analogy etc. We will study in greater detail in the next class.